My name is Torsten Norgaard, I'm a Danish photographer. I travel the world taking photographs and teaching photography. Today I will talk a little bit more about the Leica M11, but also photography in general and what to do with our time. Below the video here, there's some free stuff. There's an ebook I wrote about some of the historic photographs and the historic photographers, and also how do I photograph and why do I photograph. And also today, I put some extra links for free styles for Capture One and free presets for Lightroom, and that is the ones that I use when I edit. And some of them is for making black and white, some is for making colors, and some is for a little bit of a special effect. I don't like a lot, a lot of special effects, but I have some that does something when you like out there, you don't know what to do, you use one of those. They are below the video and they're free. You just use the promo code, it says there. Today I will talk a little bit more about the Leica M11 and that's not true. I actually don't want to talk about it, but I will talk about it anyways for a little bit because I have more articles and more videos coming about uh, this camera as it's almost like a tradition. Uh, when a new Leica comes out, I use it uh, for whatever I'm doing and then I write about it, how to get it to work, what SD cards to use, how to tweak this. Um, and that is what I'm doing with the M11 also. And let's just take the brand new thing, is there's a new firmware that is the one that Leica when the M11 came out uh, 13th of January, they said in the autumn 2022 that's going to come out a new firmware uh, that will do different stuff. Um, and that firmware actually came in May 2022. It didn't do much for the M11 because there's actually not a firmware update for M11, but there is for uh, M10P here, and there is for M10R here, and also for the monochrome, and I think also the M10 uh, normal one, and there's also for the M10P ASC, that's the limited edition for filmmakers that like I made, that is really nice with brass or gold lenses, or no, not gold lenses, brass lenses. Um, not much to say about it really. What it does do is that you have this electronic viewfinder EVF that comes with the, the M11 uh, and sits like this, higher resolution, made of metal and everything. This one can now be fitted on uh, the M10P and M10R and M10 monochrome. And that enables you to, uh, uh, yeah, to use this EVF instead of uh, the one that you could say originally came with the M10P, M10, M10R. Is this one? Uh, this is called Visoflex 2. This is called EVF 2. So they almost have the same name. They kind of do the same thing. Uh, this is 2.4 megapixels. This is 3.7 megapixels. Um, and they look a little bit different, like this one was originally made for uh, the like a TL or like a T. Uh, so when it came for this one, like I said, no, it's too expensive to change the housing of this. So we're just going to go with this. So it's kind of overlaps the shutter speed dial here. It looks a little bit uh, not amazing, pretty. But that's the one we used for the last uh, four, five years on the Leica M10 series and it can tilt, it can swirl like this, you can photograph like this and you can go like this and it has a rubber here uh, to protect glasses and then you can set that there up to here. So finally when the M11 came out, we'll put it back over here, when the M11 came out Leica actually made a new housing and a new EVF and they made it higher resolution, more megapixels. And now it's square and it's made of metal and also it swirls. It has a diopter adjustment here uh, and everything. So now you can put this on these cameras. There is no firmware so you can actually put this one on uh, the M11. Uh, and you can say that would in a way make sense if you could because this one you can get. This one is still very hard to get so you can say yeah you update your firmware now you can use both uh, this EVF and this EVF on this one, but you can't get this one, most likely. Later, of course, you can, and then you can ask yourself, or you can ask me, which one should I get? 
And my response is basically, it doesn't matter. And why does it matter? Well, well, in a maybe it's, it's, this is like this is one of the things that's going to keep you <laughs> awake <laughs> at night. So these are basically right now same price. Uh, this is 3.7 megapixels. This is 2.4. So in traditional photography, you could say, of course, you want more megapixels. You want the newer model. Uh, this one is metal and everything. Um, okay, so here's what it means. Uh, that now you can use this one on uh, the M10P here, it means absolutely nothing. What happens is that the image actually um, is a little bit smaller on this one because this is a higher resolution. So basically like they, they cropped it because it only supports 2.4 million. So we basically get 2.4 million uh, pixels, but then you can say you use this one on this one also. I think, like I said, at some point you can use this one also on the M11. Okay, so back on track, same price, different resolution, except when you put an older camera you have the same resolution as this one. Um, one of the things that I like about this one is kind of like it's metal, it's, it's great design and it's new. So something is new is always promising, you think okay that's going to be, uh, that's the future. Um, but when you look for this one, because it's square, you actually get a lot of light in here. So sometimes you have to cover here. Uh, this one, because it's round, kind of like covers for more. And then it comes down to taste. Uh, which one do you think looks uh, the worst or the best on the camera? Should it be like this one or should it be this one? So that's the new in, you could say Leica World, this is a brand new uh, high-tech stuff that now you can uh, put on two EVFs on the previous model. And why doesn't it mean anything? Well, it doesn't mean anything because even if you had a one megapixel resolution EVF, you can still see what you're supposed to see. So that means the great thing about an EVF <coughs> is that if you want to use electronic viewfinder, then you could say one way of doing it is just you turn on the camera here and then you press uh, live view and now you have live view here and you look at this screen and some people will actually look at the screen like this and then they can they can focus with this one i can't do it it's kind of like it should be out here somewhere or around here and i don't like this idea if you're standing with a camera like this and you have sun then it's not great um, so a little bit more traditional like they think that no, you have to look for a uh, range finder here. Uh, but that's not true. You could say a lot of uh, younger people or people who are new to photography who came from iPhones, they are used to looking at a screen like this. So they think it's all natural to look at your camera like this and there's a lot of advantages with it. Then what happens when you put an EVF in front of here, it's relatively a really big screen you're looking at. So this is how much the EVF feels in your view field, whereas the screen here is just here. It's just this small screen. So that makes a diff big difference. Like you get really close to whatever you're doing by putting on an EVF. And then that is why if it's 3.7, 2.4 or half a megapixel or one megapixel, doesn't really matter because what do you use an EVF for? Well, you use it for seeing what is happening, so you can have the right timing. You see what is the frame, which is very easy because you only see what's going to be in the picture. You see, with this one, you see what the sensor see. And then you see the exposure. And you can set the preview of the camera to black and white to do not have to deal with if the colors look great or not great in the EVF or on the screen. Uh, so you set it to black and white. It's just a matter of when is it in focus and when is the exposure right and when is it the right timing within this frame to take a photograph. And that is why it can be done with half a megapixel, 20 megapixel. It doesn't really matter. It's not the resolution because as soon as you turn uh, the focus in the ring here, um, the, the EVF is going to zoom in anyways, either 5x or 10x. So if you imagine like you're taking a photograph of five cars, it's going to zoom in on the front of one car, and you see the number plate, now you can focus precisely on that, and then you press the button slightly again, it goes back to full frame, and now you can frame the whole thing, and you have the focus right. So, but the thing is, when the M11 came out, 
there was so much focus on all the megapixels and this new EVF that now you can see everything clearer and whatever, it's going to be amazing. So it's kind of like, no, you have to have an EVF with uh, the M11, it's about the EVF, everything. And that's actually not what I think. What happens when you put on uh, the EVF here on the M11 is that it is a brand new amazing camera. It's like wow this is awesome and you can zoom in and you can say when you have the EVF on it uh, you turn on the camera and then uh, you can actually when you take a photo instead of like turning this zoom you can actually a good idea is to turn off the automatic uh, focus aid which is, means that when you turn this one it zooms in. Uh, instead what you do is that you take it up to the eye and the great thing about this EVF is that it is blacked out uh, when it's not in use and when you take it to the eyes then it turns on. That's great so it does, doesn't use a lot of battery. And then you have it up here and then you, when you press this little button here it's going to actually focus in and then or zoom in then you can focus and then you press back now you have the full frame and you can take the photo. Uh, that's great. The only problem with the EVFs is that uh, you could say you turn on the camera, the shutter goes up, it takes a couple of seconds, it can be slower if you have the wrong SD card, it can be faster if you have a good SD card, but about two seconds, expect that. Then you take it up to the eyes and then it turns on with half a second delay. Then you press the button and then it's one second delay, then it zooms in, then you press here now half a second or maybe only one tenth, you're back to full frame and you take the photo and then it's blacked out for half a second or maybe one second and then you see what you're looking at again. So that's a lot of delay compared to just that you have a rangefinder camera here so you can say yeah you turn it on and well you have to wait two seconds for this one to turn on but then you focus here and there you have it you take the photo, there's no blinking, there's no dark screen one second after you take it, there's no zooming in that you have to wait for to zoom in. You just ready, you see here live what is happening and you can take a photo. And um, when I used, uh, well I still use it, but when I used the M10 series, the M10R and the M10P and also before that the M10 a lot, um, I actually started out with not using the VF because I thought this was so ugly, I'm not going to use it. Then there's other times where it actually does make sense to use the VF because it's almost like taking a Polaroid. You get to preview the exposure and everything, exactly what you see and depth of field. So it gives a lot of certainty. So it slows you down a little bit but it gives a lot of certainty. So if you imagine you're doing portraits, you kind of lose some of the direct contact with the subject and you're not as alert because you're looking into an EVF that have a delay and maybe you're zoomed in on the nose or the eye so you actually don't see the expression of what they're doing before you zoom out again. So you lose something there but then you get that you get to see exactly what you're doing. So that's a good and bad thing so I kind of have done a lot where I did portraits that would do half of them without uh, the EVF and the other half with the EVF. So I had half of the series was like focused on having the correct exposure technology and everything uh, and focus and the other one I was just playing around with a rangefinder and kind of like hoping this is going to work which funny enough it often does if you have if you are from the generation that you have used a film camera then you have had a camera where there's no screen you can't preview anything you can't even tell if the shutter works or if the film is uh, winding rewinding till you get the film back from the lab. If it's, if it's a professional lab, you can get it back in one hour. If most people, they will send in the film to somewhere. They will open it, they will it themselves. So it would take hours or days before you actually get to see <laughs> what did I do. And funny enough, mostly what you did actually worked really well. And that's one thing you can test, uh, like I made the MD262 and M10D that are cameras without a screen. And first time I got a Leica MD262, it freaked me out. I was so I mean, nervous and I was like, I was something when I walked out of it because like I can't see what I'm doing. So I'm just kind of shooting in blind. 
and you come back, you put in the card and computer, you find out this is the same as with a screen. I don't need a screen. And then you think, no, that's, that's how it used to be with film. I didn't have a screen, you know, I'll go three weeks to, to India and Sri Lanka and photograph uh, hundreds of rolls of film. I had no idea what uh, pictures I got. Of course I had an idea, but I didn't have the certainty of a screen. So that is totally possible. And here we get to the, the thing, the new thing about the M11. So I get so many questions on email and in person. Should I get the M10R, should I get the M11, and what do you think about it, and blah, blah, blah. And I actually also have, a, it's funny, I have a lot of people in cafes and on the street and everywhere, and they see me with this cam, it's like, wow, that's like a nice old cam. I said, no, it's actually brand new. It's like, wow, oh, it has a screen, wow. And then sometimes you ask how many megapixels, I said, oh, it's 60. It's like, wow, 60 megapixels, you know, that's amazing. How can they fit all this in this little camera? So, I get these questions all the time, should I get the M11? And I don't know if you should. Uh, I bought the M11 because that's what I do. Uh, and I expected this is going to be uh, an amazing camera. And what, uh, let me just be honest, this camera, when it came out, 13th of January 2022, was not ready. The firmware was not optimized. Uh, I'll get into in other videos about the colors and the black and whites and other stuff and how to set up the menu. But you could say one of the confusing things was that Adobe Lightroom, that is one of the programs you use to edit raw photos that you get from this one, uh, didn't have a profile ready. Then it turns out in, I think, in uh, April that they actually had the profile since before the camera came out. They just hadn't updated the list of profiles. So that means the colors we were looking at from the Leica M11 in Adobe Lightroom is actually, that's the final colors, that's how it's going to look. Uh, and that's essential because once you know this is how the hardware, the electronics, the software works, then you can fine tune it to your own workflow. Till you have the right tools, you can't really do anything. So it was kind of like, yeah, let's, let's wait for Adobe. And Adobe said, oh, we already, by the way, we just forgot to update our website. We did uh, make a profile for this, so this is what you get. And you could say, maybe you like this, maybe you don't. I don't like it, I like the Adobe, Adobe Standard, which have been there all the time. Uh, that is okay for this. I like even better Capture One. Uh, they had a profile ready from the moment uh, the Leica M11 came out. So you can see there is uh, the right colors. That's a different story. All the colors and everything I'll get into in another video. Um, but you can say the firmware was not ready. There was some stuff with the shutter. Uh, there's still some stuff. Um, and you can say this thing is like, will there be a firmware for this or not? Uh, nobody really knows. And then you can say what is characteristic about the M11 is it's just layered with so much new technology. And you could say the slogan of Leica is the, the essential, the Wesentliche. Uh, that's a German thing, it means the essential. So that's like, yes, this is a Leica. So look here, you don't have 250 buttons, you don't have a, a function button here, a function button here, a function button here, and one here, and one here like you have on a Sony or a Fuji. No, Leica is very simple. It's made of brass, you can do like this way, you can, you can use it as a hammer, it's still going to take photos. And then I have an ISO dial here, it's an aperture here, focus here, shutter speed here, on and off. And then I have a few buttons here for show me the picture and you can go into the menu. And the menu is relatively, dramatically simple compared to, uh, to other cameras. That is what is the essential of a camera and that is the beauty that most people get attracted to when they just hold a Leica. Even they don't know where the range finder is or anything, they're just like, wow, this is there's something about this. And that is the simplicity of uh, the Leica that is basically like the same camera that has been remade for 100 years. It's like, it's the same, it does the same, uh, the buttons kind of almost sit the same place and it didn't add a lot of stuff. And that's the great thing about a Leica. So now we get a camera that has all kinds of choices that you have to make. Yeah, you can do three different resolutions, you can do 60, Make a picture, you can do 37, you can do 18. And then you go on forums or you talk to people and people discuss like, oh, is there like more, uh, less noise in the ISO if you go down in resolution? 
is there more dynamic range if you go down the resolution? And nobody knows. And some people say, yeah, I can see it, and other people I can't see a thing. So here you have something where you, you buy this camera, and you think this is the thing. And then now you have to decide, should I go 60 megapixels, 37 or 18 megapixels? And why do I have those three choices? Uh, and it's kind of like, no, that is not something you should be bothered with. Uh, but, but you say that's very normal these days. Uh, you buy an iPhone or anything electronics these days, it, it's, it gives you all kinds of choices that you have to make decisions about. So you have to study this and find out what do I think about this. And then they come with a new model one and a half year later. And now you have to figure it out again. Um, so this is something like I should have spared the users for. I said, okay, this is a 40 megapixel, 40 megapixel camera or it's a 60 megapixel camera. And that's it. That's how it is. Um, <clears throat> so there should be less choices. And it's be simpler. So here, here's what I did. I happened to just, by coincidence, going into my archive, and I was looking at uh, some workshops I did in Berlin and other places in 2011, 2010, when the Leica M9 came out. And this is uh, this one. This is like a M9. You see, you can hardly, it's different colors, but else you, can, you can't actually tell the difference. It's very <laughs> similar. That's the great thing. It's a Leica, same, same stuff as last time, new model name. So, but what happened is like, I looked at the workshop photos and I looked at the people doing my workshops and I thought back, wow, and I thought like, wow, we were so happy back then. We were really happy that for the first time we had a digital full frame camera. It was like having a good old Leica film camera, but now you had a digital sensor. Everything else was the same. Um, and somehow that got a lot of uh, people back into photography. Uh, I had a lot of people that, yeah, they used to have a film camera, but they didn't really use it anymore because it was so complicated and they wanted a digital or they're using the phone or something. And now finally they got a Leica digital because they always loved the Leica and now they could be the digital. And I look at some of the photos, like we're walking around the streets or we're having dinner, and it's just a party. It's just, we had a great time. And then I look at the pictures like, wow, these photos have a great atmosphere. I like these photos. Uh, I wouldn't say they're perfect, but they're beautiful. <laughs> they have atmosphere. And then I made a decision. I said, okay, damn it. Um, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna put on, I'm gonna take on DVF, off with DVF. Uh, this camera, the first week I had it, uh, the strap broke and it landed like this on DVF and that's why it's uh, it stick together here with the uh, tape. And the DVF is a little bit out of sync. And that's something you can test, you can always, I'll just put that in here. If you're in doubt, is my camera in sync, the rangefinder focus, you go outside, you have a view outside a window and you have something far away, a skyscraper or a chimney, some trees or a mountain. And then when you turn the focus ring here to infinity, which is this infinity symbol, there's like the eight that lays down means infinity. When you turn to that one, with the farthest away you can focus, then the mountain or whatever is out there should be in focus. So that means it has to overlap precisely. If you can focus or to the other side of this mountain at infinity, your focus is off. If you can't focus to it, you like you stop here, you can't, you can't turn it, you can't get it into focus, then it needs adjustment. And that is simply just uh, this little thing here is the focus mechanism of the rangefinder, and that's the one that's out. It's not something you can do yourself with a screwdriver. There's like three screws inside, so it have to go to somebody who knows what they're doing. And I would say, I sent my stuff to Leica in Germany. They have new special machines for this. There's also a third party that knows, have special tools and screwdrivers and they can adjust it. Uh, it's not, I'm not always super happy with what they do. They kind of like adjust it, but then it's not actually. Uh, I sent it to Leica in Wetzlar or go visit them. And it's like, it's perfect. Uh, so this one is not perfect in focus and I put on an imperfect lens. I put on this 50 millimeter rigid 
uh, 2.0 lens that is from uh, 56 it came out. It's not an expensive lens, it's a lens you can get from like $400 to $2,000. It only gets to $2,000 if it looks perfect on the outside. Uh, the optics here is uh, the same. So you get one for $400, just be happy, or $500. Uh, and it's a great lens and it kind of uh, also give people the idea that this is your granddad's film camera that you inherited and now you're out in the streets uh, taking photos. So why did I do this? Because I thought, okay, I can't give a damn about these megapixels and three layers of this and two layers of this and all those choices and this high ISO and electronics, I don't care. I'm just going to use this as a camera and I know that sounds radical. But I'm just going to use it like it's a camera. Like the M9, I basically don't care if it's the M9 or M11 or you could say M10P, it's the same camera. I use it to take photographs. And the type of photographs I take is atmosphere, it's emotion. I'm capturing emotion and light. And they're not always in focus and they're not always detailed. And you can say, yeah, with 60 megapixels you can, you can capture amazing details. You can put on a lens like this. This is the 50 Apo, uh, the world's best 50 and the colors and uh, the details, everything sinks. But how often do you need that? You could say if you take a photograph in uh, the evening or in a nightclub, a jazz club, or anywhere you take photos of your kids playing in the sunshine in the garden, you don't need, you don't care about the details. And especially if you take black and white, you don't care about the colors. And even like, it's almost like better if the tones look like old school black and white, then it looks like, you could say, the newer lenses we have, the 50 zoom looks here, have really fantastic detail and high contrast. This one have the same, even to the extreme. But why? That's actually not what it's about. And that's the problem, you could say, you get, you get into the middle of like, wow, there's a new model coming out. Uh, we've been waiting for it. Okay, let's get it. And let's get put on the EVF here. And then, it, and then you sit there and you have to compare can I, actually, can I actually see I have 60 megapixels or can I not? Or, or, I mean, there's a whole forum post about people who can't get sharp photos with the M11 and I can't figure out what they mean because, yeah, I don't know. But I kind of know that they're zooming in and they can't see the details or whatever. But maybe there isn't any details. Maybe you didn't do it with the right light because what creates apparent sharpness and detail is light is not the lens, it's not the megapixels. So skip the megapixels. Uh, and so that's what I did. I just said, I'm going to use this one. And I did other radical things. I, I did like, uh, I did a couple of magazine shoots of, of portraits. And I used this lens and I used the 50.95 Noclux, which is not a perfect lens. It kind of is a perfect lens, but kind of a very dreamy. And if you go into detail, you can have purple fringing and everything, but because that's what you get when you have a wide open piece of glass like that. And then I did something crazy. I took this 7 Artisan uh, 1.1 lens and, uh, and I put it on this one. And I didn't use a rangefinder, which is uh, kind of ridiculous because uh, one of the things with the 7 Artisan is that it comes with a screwdriver. <laughs> so you can adjust the focus yourself, so it's basically never really accurate in focus. Uh, so when I use this one, I would use a VF because then I can see what the lens is doing with the rangefinder here. I don't really know. But this lens is great for portraits and stuff because it just lights explodes left, right and center. And it's a $400 lens and that's what it's good for. You take architecture or street, it looks, it looks like crap. It just can't uh, focus, <laughs> it can't get the details, the it's light is floating left, right and center. So it's not for historic photos to show a street or this is how it is. It's for explosive dreamy portraits. So, so in the spirit of this is just a camera, I'm taking photos, I don't care about 60 megapixels and everything. I put on this one and I took some photos and it shouldn't work but it actually did work. And it looks amazing and that's what they're going to use. Um, so that's what I did uh, with the M11. You can say that is my review uh, so far on the M11. I'm not, I'm far from done because I'm doing books and video classes and YouTube videos and free articles on my website. But basically just uh, for now the review is I don't care, this M11. I'm going to just use it as a camera. I know that is shocking. 
and it didn't answer your question that you would email me or ask me in the comments down here or you will ask me in person in my workshop or when I do my, my walk with me around the world, should I get the M11? I don't know. You could say I got the M11 for uh, a while I was sure, no, I'm going to get rid of this again. That's it. I'm not, this is, no, I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, but then I kind of decided like, no, like I'm not, it would be nice just sell it, buy some nice, nice fountain pens and just don't give a damn. But it's not really my style. I, ca I kind of like keep stuff and I kind of like try to get stuff to work. Uh, and on great days, I forget this is M11. It's just a Leica. It's just a camera. It takes photos. And I actually don't, I don't get bothered by uh, <laughs> three types of megapixels or three sizes uh, of resolutions. I don't get bothered by a live view on which button is what. I just take photos. And the only thing I change is the ISO. And there we go. And then now that we are talking vertical, oh, I'll actually show one little thing here. So I have this one is 28 5.6. This is also seven artisans, the same that made this crazy lens. If this is an awesome lens, 50 1.1, $400 or 398. And you can get it black or silver. Uh, this is fun for portraits and dreamy stuff. Then they made a 28 5.6. And you say it's very similar to the one that uh, TT something, Artisans or whatever, make and of course also like his own. Uh, it's a tiny little lens. And I don't know if I'm going to do more review on this one, but this one has very high contrast, which is uh, great for this. Uh, it has straight lines, so I mean you have a wide angle lens and you take a photo of a building or a street, you don't want to have the lines going like this. So the object is okay, there's straight lines uh, and high contrast and good clarity, good colors and it cost like almost nothing, this lens. And you can say, the fun thing about it, of course, is that um, you can put it on a camera like this one. Let's just do that and see if I can find out. There should be a red dot on this one, but I don't see it anywhere. So let's see where does it fit, there it fits. So, and even without this, then you can say you have this uh, nice little lens and that's what some people think is fun. And you could say it's great for street photography. You need a lot of light because it's 5.6. Um, but you basically say you can just walk around with it here. And you can, even, I mean, if you go 5.6, 8, 16, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same. Everything from here to way over there is going to be in focus. So there's going to be no playing around with depth of fields or anything with this one. And then you can basically just get like, oh, this guy, he's like, uh, he's five meters away. Okay, I'm just going to put it here. And everything, you said F16. <laughs> Uh, you could say you could basically set it here. If you let's just say you set it f11 is here, so you can see this is the depth of field scale, and you have the infinity system. In, infinity symbol is here by 11. So if I set it f11, then everything down to 80 centimeters is going to be in focus from here and all the way. So that makes it very easy. You just point it like this. As long as you hold a, a wide angle lens upright like this, you have straight lines. As soon as you tilt it here, lines are going to go this way. You tilt it this way, they're going to go this way. So if you want a straight lines, you hold it like this, or you hold it like this, and it's very wide. So that's kind of like a fun lens. And you can say also, if you have a 5.6 lens and you use it 11, uh, f11, you can't really tell if it's great optics or not. I mean, it's almost impossible not to make a sharp lens uh, in this size and with this f-stop and a wide angle. It's, it can't really go wrong. Uh, so if you dream of uh, having this special like small street photo lens, uh, there's uh, several of them like TT make them, uh, seven artisans make them, which I kind of like because they made this one. I also have the 75 and a few other of their stuff. Now let's get serious because um, yeah, you should always have a camera with you and you should take uh, photographs whenever you feel like it. And here's another thing that um, I think is more productive than reading reviews or wondering should I get the M11 or should I not get that or should I get this one or should, maybe I should get, try the Hasselblad or maybe I should get a phase one, you know. Uh, those things are fun to consider and sometimes it's also nice to get a new camera. Uh, but one thing I actually like, uh, or I have done recently, and which kind of led me to into, now I'm just going to use 
the M11 here as a camera is that I went back in my archive. And then you think, what, it, what, what, what was I doing back in my archive while I was looking for something? And then I stumbled over uh, a lot of interesting pictures that I did like 10, 15, even like 25 years ago. Uh, so it's almost become a new thing for me that I will spend. I know as soon as I dive into the archive, there goes three hours. Um, and I'll find stuff and I think, what should I do with this? Uh, wow, that's a great photo. And then I will send it to like well, my kids or friends or whoever was like some pop star will send me a picture. Here, this is you 20 years ago before you had gray hair. Um, and, and there's also some of the stuff is like, no, that's a book project. Or there is actually book projects where it's like, why? Why didn't I print this book or reprint it? Uh, <clears throat> so that's what I'm doing and that's actually a solid suggestion for you. Go look in your archive. I mean, it's great to buy cameras and <laughs> lenses, but it's about photography. And you did take photos. Most likely you took photos uh, back in the day. Even maybe when you were a teenager or whatever. Go find those photos, organize them, use them for something. And, and somehow that leads me into, uh, I got this one. So this is uh, Hollywood Authentic. So this is a new uh, magazine. I actually don't know if it's free or not. I forgot if I paid for it or not. Um, but this is uh, Greg Williams. He's, he shoots uh, Leica Q2. Uh, yeah, you can hardly see him here, but, uh, but he did this and it's kind of like... Uh, um, I would say I am unimpressed and I'm, and I'm tired of Hollywood. Uh, I don't live there anymore and I think uh, they waste a lot of time. On, uh, on whatever, social media and so on. Uh, and they make not a lot of great movies. They actually make really bad movies uh, and TV series these days. That's my opinion about it. But his idea with this is that you have a lot of access uh, to stars, film stars, celebrities and so on behind the scenes and doing filming and their private life. So this is actually the idea of this one, is to go back in time 30, 40, 50 years ago when photographers had much more access to celebrities. Uh, so that's when you go back in the Getty Image Archive, you will see uh, photos from the balcony of uh, the Cannes Festival where some movie stars are hanging out, having a drink or coffee or a cigarette or whatever, and, and the photographer is right there and taking photos. And I always love this style. I don't like this red carpet. I don't like this uh, look at me and all this. I like the lifestyle of it. And, and it's a very promising lifestyle, of course. You can say that's why Hollywood is so popular, because Hollywood gives you an idea that this is great. This is the life, you know. I mean, most movie stars are on drugs and divorced for the fifth time or in court case with somebody of their exes. Uh, but still, the, Hollywood has this aura of like, this is the life. And that is what he's trying to do here. And you can say, well, <laughs> it's the wrong timing. There's, there's not a lot of style or things about Hollywood. We said, hey, look, kids, this is how I want you to become when you get older, because I don't want my kids to be like that. But it's still, it has something about it. And of course, photo photographically, um, it's amazing to look at. And uh, so that's what he did, and here he has, you have uh, Sean Penn is in, in his kitchen. Um, and that's amazing, and you get to see uh, Sean Penn, you have like here. Uh, this is Sean Penn's living room, you have, he has a remote control on the table, uh, a yellow uh, pen, and it's a mess. And uh, it looks like he haven't had any cleaners come for the last two months. But you get to look at the pictures, and you get to look, oh, this is the glasses he's wearing, he's, he bought them in uh, 7-Eleven or somewhere. Uh, and some of his stuff is cool, and you can see this is the car he drives, and so on. So that's a great idea. And what I, <laughs> what I like about it is this is photography, and it's on paper. It's like out there. It's not, it's not like Dick Williams is still considering if he should get a phase one or go Hasselblad or keep doing uh, the like a Q2. No, he's actually making photographs and he's publishing it. And it's awesome. It's great. Uh, more along that line, I will uh, just give you a little warning here. This is a cover for a magazine I'm doing soon and there will be 
you can always send me an email and say, hey, put me on a list. But there will be a place where you can sign up and you can get this magazine for free digital. And then there will also be a print version you can pay for. And here's a, problem, a couple of the co-authors. Uh, this is uh, Lights, the founder of Leica. And the magazine is called Oscar. Um, named after Oscar Barnack that invented the Leica. Just because Oscar is a cool name. It actually had... When I went to school, when I was a kid, uh, I had, uh, I used the name Oscar also. Not with a K, but with a C. Uh, and actually Oscar Barnack can be spelled both Oscar with K and Oscar with C. Different story, I might get into that somewhere another day. Uh, so that's what I like to do, and that that's like a, an honest idea. Go look in your archive, go look, what can I do with my photos? Should I send them to somebody digital or via messenger or email or should I make a print for them? Maybe I should do a book. Uh, but, but you don't have to decide. You look first and say, wow, I have a lot of great photos of this or that. Uh, and then you think I should do some way, something with it. There's also sometimes you find a great photo and it's like, wow, that's a great photo. Then you print it out, but then it's kind of like you compare it to what else you've done. And it's kind of like, no, that was like, that was a good memory. But it wasn't a good photo. So that also happens. So that's kind of like it goes back and forth. But once you start diving into the archive, because you have an archive, you have taken photos with the cameras uh, and they should go somewhere. So that's kind of uh, how far <laughs> we'll get today. I'll also say I love uh, notebooks. I love pens here. So actually, this is almost like when I go to town and have a coffee. This is my kit. I have a notebook with a pen attached and I have my camera uh, and I don't have any VFF. I don't care. I'm just taking photos and then I'm writing uh, notes. Uh, and in here I have uh, notes for books and everything else I'm doing. Uh, I'm even doing a book in Danish. So I don't know what, what's going to happen with that. It will be in Danish, probably also in English at some point, but I just thought, hey, let me go back to writing Danish because it's a different style and tone. It's almost like going back to film or a big wooden camera or something. It's going to be different. So, so that's what I'm playing around with. And I think uh, if we so say that any, any essence of it didn't like take photograph, express yourself, make something uh, like this that you can smell, something that burns if you put a fire to it, something you can send in the mail and uh, you, can, you can make sketches on it. Uh, and then let's forget about how many megapixels went into making this because nobody really cares. That's all I had to say today. Remember till I see you the next time to always wear a camera. And of course, below the video, there's links to free stuff.